a new wave of Russian strikes on Kyiv. Ukraine says its air defense system intercepted 36 missiles and drones over the capital city early Friday. At least two people were injured. Meanwhile, multiple explosions have been reported in a Russian-occupied port city in southern Ukraine. A Ukrainian official there says Russian positions have been hit. And this comes as Russian border regions are struck by fresh attacks. Sam Kiley joining us. Um, Sam, a new wave of these hits towards Kyiv, uh, many of these missiles intercepted and, and frankly a lot of activity in Russian occupied territories as well as what we're seeing inside of Russia this week. There's been so much activity. Yes, Eleni, uh, what we can see now is very obviously a new campaign conducted by the Ukrainians uh, or, or on the behalf of the Ukrainians, Ukrainians inside Russia. They're not taking any direct responsibility for the uh, invasion or raids being carried out by Russian nationals who are badged effectively to the Ukrainian armed forces crossing into Belgorod region. But that's just what they have done with uh, the local authorities in Russia saying two people have been killed in uh, bombing or mortar attacks in frontline villages at the same time in Smolensk, another Russian city uh, north of uh, Kyiv. Uh, the oil refinery has been hit by what is assumed to be a drone attack similar to the one that hit in uh, Krasnodar uh, south of the country. So uh, there is a pattern emerging here on top of the pattern that is long pre-existing, which is the systematic targeting, particularly of Kyiv, particularly of civilians by the Russians inside Ukraine. Now, this is having a strategic effect, the uh, campaign inside Russia with Vladimir Putin coming out today saying that essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, we mustn't get rattled, we mustn't allow them to destabilize Russia. But that's exactly what these uh, relatively small scale attacks inside Russian territory are intended to do to destabilize uh, the Russian effort. Uh, with Ukraine making all kinds of claims about the movement of Russian special forces uh, into that area, which are unverifiable, but again are intended, uh, whether they're true or false, to sow unease, discomfort and dismay among the Russian forces as they continue to, to threaten to prosecute a campaign, a counteroffensive inside Ukraine to recapture lost territory. But I think we should see these campaigns inside Russian territory as the early stages of their counteroffensive. Sam Kiley, great to have you on. Thank you so much. And we're now joined by Timothy Milovanov. He is the president of the Kyiv School of Economics, and he is coming to us right now from Kyiv. It's uh, very nice to see you, and uh, we want to try and get the measure of what it's been like the last few uh, nights, especially as Russia continues its assault. I mean, could you ever imagine um, that you and your fellow citizens would be under this kind of siege now almost a year and a half after this invasion began? Yeah, when the start, uh, when the war started, I, you know, we all hoped that would end fast. But uh, several months into the war, uh, you know, I think too many of us came a realization that might go on forever. And we know how brutal uh, Russia is, especially after the early revelation in Bucha and Borodanka. So I'm not surprised they're trying to target civilians with missiles. But let me tell you. This last month was really, really difficult. I think everyone cannot sleep. Uh, everyone is traumatized. Uh, we have been through maybe 18, 19 attacks in the last 30, 32 days. Uh, this is brutal. Every night I expect to be awake at 3 a.m. Uh, being afraid of missiles. Yeah, and I can imagine when you're dealing with all of that after so many months, and then some people are in their home with young children, with elderly, with disabled people, it must just strike terror in so many people night after night after night. It strikes maybe not terror, but fear, fear for the loved ones, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and then anger at Russia. Now, you argue that Ukraine needs to prosecute this war itself, defend itself. But, you know, you kind of are saying in a way, and you have been for months now, that Ukraine cannot submit to this state of war. For one thing, you've been advocating that the rebuilding should actually start now. Why? I mean, and you can understand the reluctance, right, of international partners who are saying, you know, especially under the barrage that you've had the last few weeks, this is not a good time to think about rebuilding the country. 
Well, that's because when people are far from the situation itself, they tend to simplify. They simply don't have enough context, enough visuals, enough emotions. For them, it's a war, and then there will be the end of the war, and then we will rebuild. But on the ground is something very different. You have a clinic. Clinic has been destroyed. People have to continue to get care. For example, cancer patients have to get treatment, otherwise they will die. People with heart attacks have to be, get treatment and brought to the hospitals quickly in time to be safe. So we need those facilities now. When we talk about recovery during the war, we're actually not talking about rebuilding some kind of grand vision of the future of Ukraine during the war. But we are talking about maintaining the economy, maintaining the resilience, providing people with services that they need right now. You know, in one of the ways that you've been communicating with other people in Ukraine, but mostly the world, are your Twitter feeds. And you always give such an inter intimate view of your life there during wartime. I want to talk about what you posted recently because it took many by surprise. You know, it was just video, phone video of a normal day at the McDonald's. You can see it there. You're walking with the phone. Ten million people viewed it. What do you make of the reaction uh, that you got from this? Um, the reaction polar was polarizing. Some people said, listen, this is great. Ukraine is resilient. This is another example that they're like us. They continue to go about their lives as normal, and we have to support them. We stand with Ukraine. But others said, listen, guys, it looks like completely normal. There is no war. War is a fake. Don't send us our taxpayers' money to it. And I engaged with some of these people uh, on Twitter, and some of them are very, very anti-Ukrainian and pro-Russian people, and we talked privately and publicly. And I think uh, they sort of slowly start coming about because their impression is that when there is a war, it must be that everything is destroyed and people are in shelters all the time. But that's not how it is. Um, when the attack stops, Kiev comes out to war, or any city in Ukraine, any village, almost immediately. I think it's our point. We're trying to make this clear that we will continue to work, we will continue to live, and this is our answer as civilians to the Russian terror. And I think it's sometimes difficult to understand uh, from afar, uh, but I'm glad that some of my tweets uh, make this discussion public. Yeah, going to McDonald's, getting ice cream, sitting on some of those patios in Ukraine, its very own form of resistance uh, during this conflict. Uh, Timothy, thanks so much. Really appreciate you being with us, and we'll continue to check in with you.